Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mindy Mandel, and I'm here again with Jacob and Jed, and we are going on with the Republic. It is now week eight into the Republic, and we are well into book two. It's even possible that we will finish book two today, but there we're getting into some very interesting topics, and so we'll just kind of play it by ear. If we have more conversation, we'll have more conversation. But I it's possible that we will finish the book today. Uh, that said, here's just a quick review of to get you up to speed of where we're starting off today. Let me switch now to the text. Okay, so here what we're looking at is um, from um, book two. This is, um, let me get this to find this number, 372E. This is 372E. We saw that we looked at what he called a healthy state. It was rather boring to Glaucon, but perhaps comfortable to some of you. Um, he said this is the true state, I believe, to be the one that we've described. The healthy state, as it were. That's the part in blue. And if you look just above that in yellow, we see that the reason that he decided, okay, we're going to drop the healthy state and go to a more luxurious one is because by looking at a luxurious city state, we can discern the origin of both justice and injustice. So looking at just the healthy state, you see the origin of justice, that you have just what you need and nothing more. But then when you want more luxury, you're bringing in more excess. And then what we saw there was that this creates then um, the origins of war. And let me jump ahead a little now to page 165. So this is uh, 372E. No. Sorry, um, 373E. The other one was 372. And we say, well, here we see that it's because of the excesses that you want and also the excesses that you have that other people want. This becomes the origin of war, this excess going beyond what is needed. And so if you have war, it means you need an army. And so that brought in the guardians. And so that was section 15 was the guardians. And there was some talk about the guardians. And we ended with talking about the need to educate them. And oh, yeah, before I go on, by the way, back here, I don't know what the Stephanus number is. Um, 375B. At 375B, Jed had asked me about the term high spirited and what it was in Greek. And I had to look this one up. And when I saw it, I thought, oh, of course, it's thumos. And if the word thumos is not meaningful to you now, it will become meaningful later. Okay, but this you're talking about the most. Okay, so we saw like the guardians have to be um, kind to their friends, but harsh to their enemies, and they have to be brave, and there were a bunch of um, characteristics. And so now we have to look at the education, and that's where we ended it. So today what we're going into is the education of the guardians. Okay, any comments or questions before we go on? Okay, so we'll jump into the education of the guardians. And this is um, section 17. So this is 376 E, page 175, if you have the same text. And by the way, as always, there is a PDF link in the description box. Okay, so we need, um, we need a Socrates. And I think it's Eddie Montos. I'm not sure. And in, we need, a, um, anyway, we need a Socrates and an interlocutor. It's either Eddie Montos or Glaucon. I forget. They switch back and forth. So, Jacob, are you willing to be Socrates again? Or? Yes, that's fine. Okay, great. Um, so, whenever you're ready. Okay. Hmm. What then is our education? Or is it hard to find a better, a better than that which long time has discovered? Which is, I suppose, 
gymnastics for the body and for the soul music. It is. And shall we not begin education in music earlier than in gymnastics? Of course. And under music, you include tales, do you not? I do. And tales are of two species, the one true and the other false. Yes. And education must make use of both, but first of the false. I don't understand your meaning. Don't you understand that we begin by telling children fables, and the fable is taken as a whole false, but there is truth in it also, and we make use of fable with children before gymnastics. That is so. That then is what I meant by saying that we must take up music before gymnastics. You were right. I want to pause here for a moment. Okay, so there are two studies then that Socrates is recommending to begin this education of the guardians. Okay, what are the two subjects? Music and gymnastics. Right. Yes. And which one are we doing first? Music. Good. Yeah. So we're going to see, and gymnastics is going to come in book um, book three, I think. Um, but for now, we're focusing on music here and then going into book three. We'll see more about music. And we'll see that what he's really talking about here has to do with states of mind. It's the study of states of mind. And we're going to see how he's creating this analogy on the city state level. He's talking about music. And music, by the way, you know, for the Greeks, I think most people know this, but for those of you who may be new to this, when they talk about music, it's a much broader topic than what we mean by music. It includes literature, poetry, all of that. And so that's what he's going to be going into here. And so on the surface, that's what's going on. But there's something else going on at the level of the soul. And so that's when we're reading this, we want to keep that in mind. And so in this section, he's going to introduce a very famous topic, that of censorship. This is one of the things that even people who do not read Plato have heard that in his Republic, even if they've never read this, they've heard that there is something about censorship, censoring the poets. On the surface, that doesn't sound very good to us, but we're, we want to be thinking about what is really going on here. OK, so that's what we're about to get into is censorship. OK, with that in mind, let's pick it up then here. So he says, um, so we're taking up music before gymnastics. His interlocutor says, you were right. Do you not know then that the beginning in every task is the chief thing, especially for any creature that is young and tender? For it is then that it is best molded and takes the impression that one wishes to stamp upon it. Quite so. Shall we then thus lightly suffer our children to listen to any chance stories fashioned by any chance teachers, and so to take into their minds opinions for the most part contrary to those that we shall think it desirable for them to hold when they are grown up? By no manner of means will we allow it. We must begin then, it seems, by a censorship over our story makers, and what they do well we must pass, and what not reject. And the stories on the accepted list we will induce nurses and mothers to tell to the children, and so shape their souls by these stories far rather than their bodies by their hands. But most of the stories they now tell, we must reject. What sort of stories? The example of the greater stories will show us the lesser also. For surely the pattern we must, or for surely the pattern must be the same, and the, and the greater and the less 
must have a like tendency. Don't you think so? I do. But I don't appreciate, don't apprehend which you mean by the greater either. Those that Hesiod and Homer and the other poets related to us, these, methinks, composed false stories which they told and still tell to mankind. Of what sort? And with what in them do you find fault? With that, uh, with that which one ought first and chiefly to blame, especially if the lie is not a pretty one. What is that? When anyone uh, images badly in his speech the true nature of gods and heroes, like a painter who portrays or sorry, yeah, like a painter whose portraits bear no resemblance to his models. It is certainly right to condemn things like that. But just what do we mean, and what particular things? There is, first of all, the greatest lie about the things of greatest concernment, which was no pretty invention of him who told how. Uranus did what Hesiod says he did to Kronos, and how Kronos in turn took his revenge. And then there are the doings and sufferings of Kronos at the hands of his son. Even if they were true, I should not think that they ought to be thus lightly told to thoughtless young persons. But the best way would be to bury them in silence, and if there were some necessity for relating them, that only a very small audience should be admitted under pledge of secrecy and after sacrificing not a pig, but some huge and unprocurable victim to the end that as few as possible should have heard these tales. Why, yes, such stories are hard sayings. Yes, and they are not to be told, Adimantus, in our city, nor is it to be said in the hearing of a young man that in doing the utmost wrong, he would do nothing to surprise anybody, nor again in punishing his father's wrongdoings to the limit, but would only be following the example of the first and greatest of the gods. No, by heaven, I do not myself think that they are fit to be told. Neither must we admit at all that gods war with gods, and plot against one another and contend, for it is not true either. If we wish our future guardians to deem nothing more shameful than lightly to fall out with one another, still less we must make battles of gods and giants the subject for them of stories and embroideries, and other Emities, enmities, many and manifold, of gods and heroes toward their kith and kin. So I'm going to pause for just a moment because you switched a few words and it made the opposite meaning. Um, you said still less we must make these battles. Um, it says still less must we make these battles. So he's saying the opposite. That I just wanted to be clear for anyone who might be listening and not reading along with you. Um, still less must we make battles of gods and giants the subject for them of stories. So we don't want to make these um, battles the subject. So I know it's easy to switch words when you're trying to read. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 wor no worries. Okay. I just want to make clear. Okay, please go ahead. But if there is any likelihood of our persuading them that no citizen ever quarreled with his fellow citizen and that the very idea of it is an impiety, 
that is the sort of thing that ought rather to be said by their elders, men and women, to children from the beginning and as they grow older. And we must compel the poets to keep close to this in their compositions. But Hera's fetterings by her son and the hurling out of heaven of Hespestus by his father when he was trying to save his mother from a beating, and the battles of the gods in Homer's verse are things that we must not admit into our city either wrought in allegory or without allegory. For the young are not able to distinguish what is and what is not allegory, but whatever opinions are taken into the mind at that age are wont to prove indelible and unalterable. For which reason, maybe, we should do our utmost that the first stories that they hear should be so composed as to bring the fairest lessons of virtue to their ears. Okay, thank you. That was a long section there. And there's a lot going on here. So here we introduce the idea of censorship. And this one can be quite triggering, especially at the moment in America. This is a big issue that's in the news a lot. And so um, I encourage both of you to um, try not to push aside all of the, you know, the social issues going on at the moment about censorship, because there's actually something quite different going on here. We're looking at something below the surface here. So um, on the surface, yeah, it sounds very much actually like some of the things that we might be reading, talking about like accepted list, like there's um, the stories on the accepted list. You know, that's something that you may hear about in discussions about schools in America right now, where there are some groups that want to have an accepted list. And so that's just the surface story, though. OK, so we're going to try to go beyond that. So let's push aside all of the things, anything that might be triggering you. Just try to push that aside. <laughs> Take a deep breath and we'll move on. Um, so we have a lot going on here. And I think you can probably tell that there's something more going on. Just the way he's talking about this, um, going a little bit above the censorship section. Um, Do you not know then that the beginning of every task is the cheap thing? Do you see that? That's sort of near the top of what page is this? Um, near the top of page 177. So that would be 377B. So the beginning of every task is the chief thing. And especially for any creature that is young and tender. So here we're talking about kids. And so we're talking about um how we get our belief system, right? That's really what he's getting into here. And so we're looking at states of mind. Okay, so that's really the focus here. Um, it's a little difficult for me to talk about this because I know where it's going, but we have to let it unfold. And so at this point, I'm going to maybe just kind of point out some of the key, um, key sentences or some of the key phrases, and maybe we can start to get some sense of where it's going. Um, at the bottom of the page, here's a sentence that I want to pull out. Or surely the pattern must be the same, and the greater and the less must have a like tendency. Let's look at what he's talking about here. So what sorts of stories we're looking at? Okay, so this like introducing the idea of censorship. This is, again, the bottom of page 177. So we're at 377 CD area. He says, the example of the greater stories will show us the lesser also. So you see an analogy there. There's sort of an analogous relationship as above, so below. And this runs through all of our metaphysics, right? That there's a similarity, there's a similitude that runs through all. And this idea of a pattern, for surely the pattern must be the same and the greater and the less must have a like tendency. Okay, we're seeing and we're going to look at, notice that this word pattern is going to come up a lot. 
Okay, so we're looking at this pattern. What is he talking about by pattern? And then he introduces the poets such as Hesiod and Homer. And so this is where a lot of maybe like artistic people will complain about Plato. Oh, he wants to censor the poets. That's so awful. But what we want to do is ask ourselves as we're reading through this, what do the poets symbolize in the soul? Excuse me. What do the poets symbolize in the soul? And so we're looking for what kind of, he talks about fault um, in lies throughout this. Um, what do you find fault with? And he says, um, with that which one ought first and chiefly to blame, especially if the lie is not a pretty one. We're talking about some lies that the poets tell. And then here's another section where he's bringing in the idea of resemblances and from one level to the next. He says, when anyone images badly in his speech the true nature of gods and heroes, like a painter whose portraits bear no resemblance to his models. Okay, so there again, you have the idea of model and copy being introduced. Right. And he talks about the greatest lie about things of greatest concernment. He hasn't stated, though, what that is. And so that's a question we have to hold on to. What are the, what does he mean by the greatest lies and what are the things of greatest concern to us? Um, he gives some example of like Kronos and Uranus. Um, these are both intellects in metaphysics. Um, so the mythological stories, some people, of course, took them literally. But for people doing philosophy as Plato's doing this, or for, for the people that Plato was undoubtedly writing this dialogue for, um, there's an understanding that metaphysics is um, being described symbolically with the stories of mythology. Um, these are both intellects, Uranus and his son Kronos. And um, Kronos, um, he castrated his father and banished him. And then... Kronos' son Zeus did the same to his father. So on the surface, you may say that this is like a family problem that's going, that's being passed from generation to generation. But metaphysically, castration was um, symbolical of the higher realms being unitary causes. Like they only create one thing. Like there's not infinite um, realms. Like um, the, um, well, Kronos is like the intelligible. And he creates, I'm sorry, Uranus is the intelligible and he's creating Kronos, who's intelligible intellect. And there's only one. And Kronos then, as um, intelligible intellect, creates then the realm below him of intellect that is run by Zeus. And that's also only one. And it's only Zeus at the level of Zeus creating the physical world that we now have this manifestation of manyness. And so Zeus in mythology is quite the playboy when he comes down to earth, right? Spreading his seed far and wide. And so very different from his father, who has been in Kronos and Uranus, both have been banished. Banishment in mythology is symbolical of transcendence, of metaphysical transcendence. And Zeus also has a certain transcendence, but also um, an imminence within the physical world. And so they're represented in these stories in, in this way. And so if you're looking at just the surface story, this sounds like a very dysfunctional family at the very least, right? But then there is, and that's the way most people would take it. And so if you take the story on the surface, these are like, well, Kronos behaved this way or Zeus behaves this way, so why can't I? Even the gods act like this. And so it would lead to some um, wrong lessons, let's say. Whereas if you understand the metaphysics, which was only understood by the few, 
then you get a very different picture of what's going on in these stories. You read them very differently. Okay, so we see a lot of that going on here. And one of the themes that you see throughout this dialogue is reality versus image. And I think we talked about that a little bit in the introduction. We saw that with the character Cephalus, that old man who was giving sacrifices. And on the surface, he gave the image of being a pious man. But when we looked more closely at his words, we saw that he wasn't really quite as pious as he came across. Right? So there's the image versus reality. And I think I said back then that we're going to see this theme running through. And here we're seeing it again. That in the stories about the gods, Hesiod and Homer, there's the surface story, which is something of a lie. And then there is the, less, the, the story that fewer people <laughs> understand. And that brings us then, I'm sorry, is there any, does that make sense what I said so far? Any questions about that? Yeah, okay. that's good. Hmm. Now I want to go to this sentence here, and I hope I can highlight this. Um, when there's when the person who um, put this on Internet Archive did a lot of underlining, and it kind of messes up my ability to highlight. But at the bottom of page 179, he says, "If there was some necessity for relating these stories." Only a small number should be admitted under pledge of secrecy. I'll stop. There. Why would there be a necessity to read these stories? On the surface, if you're looking at this even as a, on the surface of as actually censoring the poets, doesn't it seem strange that you're going to censor them, but there may be some necessity to relate the stories that are being censored. It doesn't make sense, right? Do you see that? When something doesn't make sense on the surface, it tells you that there's a deeper meaning going on there. Why would there ever be a necessity to relate these stories of uh, Zeus and Kronos castrating their fathers and banishing them and things like this? Maybe for those underlying metaphysical truths right and if you're going to get those what does he say about it small audience right and under pledge of secrecy and the sentence goes on to talk about sacrificing not a pig but some huge and unprocurable victim so what do you have to give up in order to understand these stories and that's the question that this should leave you with so the fewest people possible hear the tales. What do you have to give up? And think about your own um, practice as a, as a philosopher. What do you have to give up in order to understand this stuff? What are the things you have to give up? And so that's where it's going. Now, there are many places where Socrates throws in terms like in our city. And so here, it's always helpful to keep in mind that there is an analogy. What is the city analogous to? Something related to justice? Yes. Well, we're looking for justice in the city. And so, and for the purpose of looking for justice, where? In the structure of the city, how it's well that that's the analogy. But what is right. the task that Socrates um, so Socrates proposed using the city as a tool, or creating a city as a tool? But what was he really aiming to look at? Do you remember? Like the origin of justice and injustice. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's fine. In the soul? Do you remember? In the soul, right. Yes. So whenever he talks about in our city, what he's really talking about is in our soul.
Okay. And then again, that idea about taking the surface story as a lesson about life. You see that on the next page here, statements like this one where he says, um, neither was, must we admit at all that God's war with God's and plot against one another and contend, for that's not true either. If we wish our future guardians to deem nothing more shameful than lightly to fall out with one another. So remember, we're training the guardians, which is some aspect of the soul. We haven't yet decided what they are, but this the the part of our soul that is like our army of sorts. It's our guardians. So whatever part of the soul guards the sovereignty and the health of the soul, we can guess it's something like that. We haven't yet narrowed it down, but we can see something like that. It has to have some sort of analogous relationship in the soul. And that part of us cannot believe these things about the God. Okay, that's what he's telling us here. Was there anything else I wanted to point out here? Um, some necessity. And key quote was um, page 183. I wanted to point something out. Oh, yes, this last section here. Um, he ends the section with this very curious quote here. Let me highlight in yellow. Um, the young are not able to distinguish what is and what is not allegory. Okay, he hasn't it clear. It's not quite clear what the young are, but if we're talking about the soul, we can imagine maybe ourselves when we were young. Or maybe when we first get into philosophy, this is our state of mind. Okay, so something that we're talking about states of mind and something about youth, either when we were kids or maybe we can carry this, um, carry the allegory a little further to us as early in our um, philosophical life. We're not able to distinguish what is and what is not allegory. But whatever opinions are taken into the mind at that age, are want to prove indelible and unalterable. Want to prove means it's likely or it's, it's a common thing, but it doesn't mean that it can't change. So there's a common idea that people don't change. That's a very cynical view, right? Many people will tell you, oh yeah, people don't change. You'll be disappointed if you expect people to change. And that's because we see very few people actually changing. But it is possible. It's not that it's impossible, and he's not saying it is, but he's saying that it's, it's very hard. It's likely to prove indelible and unalterable, but it's not unalterable. It's just that it's, it's very hard to change. And so what we're looking at by the study of states of mind is seeing what does it take in order to change. And that kind of goes back to the idea of what do you have to give up to understand those stories? Because you're not just sacrificing a pig. It's got to be something more significant. And for which reason, maybe we should do our utmost that the first stories they hear should be so composed as to bring the fairest lessons of virtue to their ears. Okay, so ideally, if we were raised um, by perfectly enlightened parents, maybe we would never learn the unhealthy beliefs. But um, most of us are not raised in such a a situation. Um, but he's going to kind of skip over that in a way um, for the sake of um, creating his city state. He's going to talk about the healthy state of the soul to get to the idea of justice. And so he skips over the idea of things like, um, like what um, I, in some of my videos, I talk about philosophical midwifery, philosophical counseling. And I think most of you watching this know that um, that the teacher I work with is the founder, really, of the philosophical counseling movement. He actually, Dr. Pierre Grimes, he actually just turned 99 this month. Um, yeah, and he's still quite healthy and active. It's really amazing. Um, but anyway, he's done quite a bit of work looking at how to uproot the false beliefs that we learned in childhood, because they are, they do feel deeply ingrained in us. 
and they do sometimes feel indelible and unalterable. Um, but it is possible to uproot them. Plato does not have such a system, like a philosophical counseling kind of system, but it's quite consistent with what he did here. But he kind of sidesteps the issue. And so we see that here. So if there is any weakness in the dialogue, it's this, that he sidestepped it. That would have been a whole nother book. And maybe it would have taken another direction. So I think he can justify sidestepping it, but it is something that's missing. And so he just says, well, it would be nice, you know, if we can just imagine skipping over that and saying that the first story should just be wise ones. If we just have we all had wise parents, we wouldn't have to deal with this stuff. We can um, develop a society of, you know, enlightened children. Um, and so that's where he's going to go with it. But um, that's why he has censorship. That we want to, what he's censoring then would be the false beliefs that we picked up in childhood. Okay. Um, any thoughts or questions about that? I don't need to, I'm going on and on here. I don't usually talk so much. Any thoughts or questions coming up at this point? It's a lot to digest. So as we go on, we're going to go further into this. And if you do want to go back to this section or you do have any questions, then just, you know, jump in. OK, so um, we're going to go on then to section 18 here. And it's going to continue Okay, the same thing here. So he gives this idea that um, we would have this censorship so that our first stories are the wiser ones. And it starts with Eddie Monta. Yes, that is reasonable. But if again, someone should ask us to be specific and say what these compositions may be and what are the tales, what could we name? Adimantas, we are not poets, you and I at present, but founders of a state. And to founders, it pertains to know the patterns on which poets must compose their fables and from which their poems must not be allowed to deviate. But the founders are not required themselves to compose fables. Right. But this very thing, the patterns or norms of right speech about the gods, what would they be? Can we pause here for a moment? So again, this idea of patterns comes up. And so here what we're going to get are the laws about the gods. And again, it may seem on the surface like religious dogmatism, but on another level, what he's getting into here is a little bit of metaphysics. So those of you who have studied metaphysics or are a little bit familiar with Platonic metaphysics, you'll probably see things that are quite familiar to you. Okay, so we're going to get the first law. Something like this. The true quality of God we must always surely attribute to him, whether we compose in epic, melic, or tragic verse. We must! And is not God, of course, good in reality and always to be spoken of as such? Certainly. But further, no good thing is harmful, is it? I think not. Can what is not harmful harm? By no means. Can that which does not harm do any evil? Not that either. But that which does no evil could not be cause of any evil either? How could it? Once more, is the good bene bene uh, beneficent? <laughs> Easy for you to say, Socrates. Yes. It is the cause, then, of welfare? Yes. Then the good is not the cause of all things, but of things that are well, it is the cause. Of things that are ill, it is blameless. Entirely so. Neither, then, could God. 
since he is good, be as the multitudes say, the cause of all things. But for mankind, he is the cause of few things, but of many things not the cause. For good things are far fewer with us than evil. And for the good, we must assume no other cause than God. But the cause of evil, we must look for in other things and not in God. What you say seems to me most true. Then, we must not accept from Homer or any other poet the folly of such error as this about the gods when he says, Two urns stand on the floor of the palace of Zeus and are filled with dooms he allots, one of blessings, the other of gifts that are evil. And to whomsoever Zeus gives of both commingled, now upon evil he chances, and now again good in his portion. But the man for whom he does not blend the lots, but to whom he gives unmixed evil, hunger devouring drives him, a wanderer over the wide world. Nor will we tolerate the saying that Zeus is dispenser alike of good and of evil to mortals. Good, thank you. Okay, so here we got the first law. He says that God is good in reality. Where was that? Oh, here. And is not God, of course, good in reality? Not highlighting correctly. Sorry about that. Um, by the way, um, reality here is ontos, which is being. And that's sometimes translated as reality because reality is what truly is. Um, and also I'm told that the word in is not in the Greek. Which is significant if you're imagining that what he's saying is that God is good in a place called reality. Um, I don't know how ancient Greeks would have read this, but that idea of being good in a place actually may very well have been something prevalent even in Plato's day because of stories like, for example, I was saying before about Zeus, how he's, he's the god of Mount Olympus and quite respected and wise in Olympus. And then he goes down to Earth and there, you know, Hera's got to keep an eye on her man because he's He's the wild party boy. And so that image was around. And then also, by the way, Zeus's son is Dionysius, who's even perhaps even wilder than his father. He's the god of wine. And also um, a lot of the mystery traditions of, of the ancient world had apparently they had some rituals to Dionysius where everybody got drunk on wine and they had like big sex orgies. And this was the way they honored Dionysius. So, I mean, this idea that God is good up in, you know, Mount Olympus and not so good outside Olympus isn't really that far fetched for them. But anyway, in English, it's often translated this way, that he's good in reality. But it's more like he's good, actually. He's truly good. He's actually good. Good in the highest sense. And then we see the pattern of how he makes his case that he wants to come then to a conclusion that he's going to take this idea that he's if he's truly good, good things are not harmful. OK, that's step one. And if it's not harmful, it doesn't harm. OK, that follows. Um, that which does no harm cannot do any evil or any bad. Okay, it's not evil in the Christian sense, but it's just bad. It cannot do if it's if it doesn't harm, it doesn't do any bad. That's true. And if it doesn't do anything bad, it cannot cause anything bad. Okay, that's an important step. If it doesn't do bad, it can't cause bad. Because to be the cause of bad things is in itself a bad thing, right? So if it can't do that, 
then the next step once more is the good beneficent right does it benefit us it, of course it is and if it benefits us then it's the cause of welfare yes then the good is not the cause of all things but things that are well it is the cause and of things that are ill it is not okay, so there we're talking about good not god but good and but then earlier we started by saying that god is truly good and so if god is truly good then since he is good he cannot be the cause of all things because he if he's truly good he does no harm and so then and then the quotes that we have here from um probably homer and yeah these um these quotes they are showing examples of this idea that zeus is the cause of both good and bad to us and this final quote here, hunger drives him because Zeus gave him only unmixed evil. I think that's probably like an ancient Greek version of the devil made me do it. And he's rejecting that as well. And will not tolerate the saying that Zeus is dispenser alike of good and of evil to mortals. Okay, everything that happens to us happens for our good. Okay, so the idea of providence. Okay, so that's the first law. Any questions or comments about that? Okay, you got it? Okay. Uh, so then we'll go on then to section 19. Do you mind keep reading or too much? Gosh, okay. can, I, uh, can I ask? Um, sure, sure. If the word in isn't there and the word is mm -hmm. being, mm -hmm. would that translate as God is good reality <laughs> so yeah, or truly um truly is you might say on toast but truly being mm. right okay because there's two ways you could take it um mm -hmm. god's nature truly is good or the second way god's nature truly is being which mm -hmm. is good mm -hmm. And it's, when it's the second one? Um, yeah, yeah, nature, nature is, not is not here. Right. So if we want to understand what God is, he's saying mm -hmm. it's ontos. That's what God is. Mm -hmm. That's the creator. Yes. And that's good. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So going on to section 19. Okay. But as to the volition of the oaths and the truce by Pandarus, if anyone affirms it to have been brought about by the action of Athena and Zeus, we will not approve, nor that the strife and contention of the gods was the doing of Themis and Zeus, nor again must we permit our youth to hear what Esclesius says, a god implants the guilty cause in men when he would utterly destroy a house. But if any poets compose a sorrows of Nobi, the poem that contains these iamblics or amblics, ambics, or a tale of the Pelopidi, or of Troy, or anything else of the kind, we must either forbid them to say that these woes are the work of God, or they must devise some such interpretation as we now require, and must declare that what God did was righteous and good, and they were benefited by their chastisement but that they were miserable who paid the penalty, and that the doer of this was God, is a thing that the poet must not be suffered to say. If, on the other hand, he should say that for needing chastisement, the wicked were miserable, and that in paying the penalty, they were benefited by God, 
that we must allow. No, so that we must allow. But as to saying that God, who is good, becomes the cause of evil to anyone, we must contend in every way that neither should anyone assert this in his own city if it is to be well governed, nor anyone hear it, neither younger nor older, neither telling a story in meter or without meter, for neither would be the saying of such things, if they are said, be holy, nor would they be profitable to us or concordant with themselves. I cast my vote with yours for this law, and am well pleased with it. This, then, will be one of the laws and patterns concerning the gods to which speakers and poets will be required to conform, that God is not the cause of all things, but only of the good. And an entirely satisfactory one. Okay, I'm going to pause here, because now we're about to move on to the second law. But first, let's just make sure we're clear on what he added here. So, going back to page 187, what was all this about? He has to comment on the negative things that happen to us, the unfortunate things, the things that we deem as unhappy. Things that make us miserable, and we have to sometimes pay a penalty for the things that we do wrong. But those are not evils, he's saying, ultimately. So what is he saying about them here? Very similar to what we saw in the Gorgias. says that they have to realize that what God did was righteous and good for them. Hmm. Their punishment is uh, fit for what they did wrong. Exactly. I, yeah, at the bottom of 187, you see they were benefited by God. So it always has to be for our benefit. Um, is there a special... Is there a special Greek meaning for the word chastisement? Not that I know of, but not. Fluent. But we saw in the Gorgias that sometimes instead of talking about punishment, he talked about, um, what was the word that was used in English? Um, correction. Correction. Yeah, some things to that effect. Mm -hmm. mm. Um. But as to saying that God, who is good, becomes the cause of evil to anyone, we must contend in every way that neither should anyone assert this in his own city. There it is again, right, in his soul, if it is to be well governed. So we're talking about the, how to regulate your own soul in a healthy way. And this is one belief that you cannot let in. And so if you hold this belief, you have to question it. He's, so Plato is telling us, for those of you who hold this belief, if you pick this up in your childhood, and it's very easy to pick up in our societies, um, you have to question it. And you have to banish that idea. Okay, so he says this is one of the laws and patterns concerning the gods. So there's one. So we saw that word pattern many times. It's the same Greek word used throughout. Um, and now we're going to go on now to the second. Okay, so Jacob, whenever you're ready. And what of this, the second? Do you think that God is a wizard and capable of manifesting himself by design? Now in one aspect, now in another? at one time himself changing and altering his shape in many transformations and at another deceiving us and causing us to believe such things about him, or that he is simple and less likely than anything else to depart from his own form. I cannot say offhand. But what of this? If anything went out from its own form, would it not be displaced and changed, 
either by itself or by something else? Necessarily. Is it not true that to be altered and moved by something else happens least to things that are in the best condition, as, for example, a body by food and drink and toil, and plants by the heat of the sun and winds and similar influences? Is it not true that the healthiest and strongest is least altered? Certainly. And is it not the soul that is bravest and most intelligent that would be least disturbed and altered by any external affection? Ooh, yes. And again, it is surely true of all composite implements, edifices, and habiliments by parity of reasoning that those which are well made and in good condition are least liable to be changed by time and other influences. That is so. It is universally true, then, that that which is in the best state by nature or art or both admits least to alteration by something else. So it seems. But God, surely, and everything that belongs to God, is in every way in the best possible state. Why, of course. From this point of view, then, it would be least of all likely that there would be many forms in God. Least, indeed. Good, thank you. So, what is, then, the second law? That the God does not change over time. His nature doesn't change. Right, exactly. Yeah, and uh, going back to page 189, there is the section here where he says, um, would we believe such things about him or that he is simple and less likely than anything else to depart from his own form? Do you see that line? It's uh, 380D just above B. E. And his own form literally is the idea, the idea of himself. He does not depart from the idea of himself, the eidos of himself. And I thought that was kind of cool. Um, so that gives you something to think about there. So he doesn't change, right? And then we have this argument that things that are healthy do not change, right? Most intelligent, by the way, in Greek is, um, it's literally the most presence of mind. And it's the same root as phrenesis. And phrenesis is a term that some of you may have heard before. Um, it's sometimes translated as wisdom, but it's often... The um, image we have of it is it's like the eye of the soul that must turn from looking downward at our everyday world to looking up to the divine. That much of our practice is about this turning of this eye, and that process of turning it is phrenesis. And so um, the soul that is bravest and most phrenesis like, or has the most presence of mind, would be the one that's least disturbed and altered by any external affection. And so, if we can even see this in humans, then surely God, who is truly good, or as good as reality, who is reality itself, and it is good, wouldn't alter. And we yeah, saw this, this, is, hmm. this section reminds me of the, uh, I, I think they call it the ontological argument for God. Or mm -hmm. that everything is either actuality or potentiality, and pure potentiality wouldn't exist because it would be pure potential. And like us, we're a mix of actuality and potentiality, but then something that would be pure actuality, mm -hmm. it wouldn't change, and that mm -hmm. could be God. 
Mm, right. Yeah, that's actually um, that that idea that the actual is prior to the potential. That it as we as reality unfolds, it becomes it moves away from the actual into the potential. That we are the potential realm. We that's the opposite of Aristotle, right? Who talked about this being the actual and the seed having the potential in it. Um, so like, we, yeah, but Plato and Plotinus and others in this tradition say that's, that's backwards. And the actual is reality itself. And as it unfolds, it becomes more into the potential. Good, yeah. Um, any other thoughts about this section? The word simple. Um, is there anything special about the word simple in the Greek? I only ask because he's defining the nature of the idea, the eidos. And, um, simple often means one, but um, where did you see it? I don't remember. Oh, the one that we read out at the bottom of 189, uh, that he is simple and least less likely than uh -huh. anything to depart. Mm. From his own form. Yeah. I don't know what the Greek is, but I would guess that you can take from that the idea that um, um, uni either unified or or um, either a unity or a oneness. Mm. So of all... Those two manifestations. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm wondering if of all of the different ideas, the different mm -hmm. aspects of being... Mm -hmm. Uh, this one we're talking about is the most singular. So the idea of one itself. Mm. I would say it points there. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Right. So Simple we're really. And less likely than anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're really. So we're really nailing down an idea of God. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's being, it's good. And of all of the ideas, it's, the most unified or the idea of oneness. Um, mm. And also it's really nice that um, mm. our soul is the most like it. Mm. So we ourselves have something that's like it and we can say, oh, by the way, of all of us, um, the thing that's least likely to change and is therefore most like mm. this one good idea, creator God, is... Um, mm soul so we have something of the divine within us that's right absolutely and a big part of understanding the soul is understanding in what way we are similar to the divine it's a place where he talked about abiding but maybe we didn't get to... hmm okay what you said reminded me of another section, but maybe I, I haven't gotten to it yet. And the, how does the idea of phronesis play into the nature of God? Well, this, sen this sentence here says, it is, is it not the soul that is bravest and most intelligent that would be least disturbed? So this was, he was building up. So if, just to remind you here, to give the, to make his case for why we would say that God is unchanging. Um, he first starts off saying the things that are in the best condition. For example, a body by food and drink and toil. And then he goes to plants. The heat and sun and wind. Is it not true that the healthiest and strongest is least altered? And then he goes on to a soul. And that's where the idea of most of bravest and most intelligent comes in. So you might say most virtuous. And then again, he goes on to talk about buildings and other things. And then it's universally true that the best state. So here's he's giving the general um, pattern here then, or the general rule. The axiom, if you will, that he's drawing from this is that it is universally true then that that which is in the best state by nature or art or both admits least alteration by something else. 
And so there he wasn't specifically talking about God. It was giving a bunch of examples in our physical world that we can relate to. And then giving a general principle. And then he concludes, But God surely and everything that belongs to God is in every way in the best possible state. End of course. And so from this point of view then, it would be least of all likely that there would be many forms in God. Okay, so that was simply part of the argument building up to that conclusion. Mm. And the soul is the, has the most courage and the most phronesis, and that's mm. what makes it the most like the divine. Well, he didn't say that there, but he was saying the soul that is the bravest and has the most phronesis is the soul that would be least likely to alter. So it's more of a comparison of different souls. If you take a brave person versus a cowardly person, or a person with lots of phrenesis versus a person who's lacking phrenesis, the one least alterable would be the bravest and the one with most phrenesis. Right. That makes sense for courage or for bravery. Um, mm -hmm. But it would also therefore follow that mm -hmm. uh, whatever phrenesis is, we should be looking to get as much of it as we can, just like we want to be as brave as we can to be most unified and singular and like the divine. Yeah. And um, it's on the surface. We can, even without quite understanding what phrenesis is, we can see just like from the English, most, in, most intelligent or I think wisest. Um, when you figured out who you are and what you value, you're least likely to be altered. Whereas a person who hasn't, who doesn't really know themselves and is just following social images, think of like high school, how many of us were in high school. It's very easy to kind of flip back and forth. You're convinced by whoever you talk to and, you know, you hang out with this group and you kind of, you know, imitate them and mold into them and you change your personality to fit them. And then you're with this other group and you change your personality to fit in with them. And, um, we're very alterable. Whereas when you know who you are and you think this is who I am and this is what I value, you're less likely to be swayed in that way. Mm. So, so likely knowledge and wisdom might be tied to phronesis in some key way. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's often translated as, you know, or sometimes knowledge. Okay, let's go on to section 20. I think this is maybe where we'll wrap it up. But this is leading, this is continuing on with this idea of not changing shape. But would he transform and alter himself? Obviously, if he is altered. Then does he change himself for the better and to something fairer or for the worse and to something uglier than himself? It must necessarily be for the worse if he is changed, for we surely will not say that God is deficient in either beauty or excellence. Most rightly spoken. And if that were his condition, do you think, Adimantus, that any one God or man would of his own will worsen himself in any way? Impossible. It is impossible, then, even for a god to wish to alter himself, but as it appears, each of them, being the fairest and best possible, abides forever simply in his own form. An, absolute necess an absolutely necessary conclusion to my thinking. No poet, then, my good friend must be allowed to tell us that the gods in the likenesses of strangers many disguises assume as they visit the cities of mortals. Let me pause Nor there. Must Sorry, oh, I, I want to pause there. Um, so what is then the second law? That they, God doesn't mm. change. Mm. God doesn't change and doesn't even, yeah, God never changes form, never wishes to change, because to change would be a change to the worst. 
Right. Exactly. And this is a very interesting phrase he uses here. And again, those of you who are familiar with the metaphysics of abiding, proceeding, reverting is all of the um, triads um, would recognize he used the word abide. And I think that's very um, intentional here. It is impossible then even for a God to wish to alter himself. But as it appears, each of them and notice he threw in there, um, so here we're talking plural of gods, for a god. But each god, so we're talking about the henads here, each of them being the fairest, or the most beautiful, and the best possible, abides forever simply in his own form. In the idea of himself. Okay, so the idea of abiding, and so... If you're familiar with the, um, with like Proclean metaphysics, for example, the idea of that one of the, um, there's the, there's the biting, proceeding and reverting. And in the highest, um, the highest essence, if you will, of each of these triads, there's the abiding, which is that it stays in itself. Before it has proceeded, there's that which stays in itself, transcendent, truly what it most is. And so there you see it right there. Um, it abides forever simply in, in the idea of itself. Simply in itself. And so then what he's going to go on to do is give some examples of this. And now he's going to go on now then to talk about, you see it's, Whoever downloaded this was kind enough to um, circle this term for us. The veritable lie. Okay, and that's where it's going from here. Um, did either of you want to make any comments? We can stop the reading here if either of you have any comments to make about, because we've covered quite a bit here. So we've got the two main laws here. Remember that God is good and that God does not change form. God is good and, and is the cause of good things only not of bad things and god never changes form but is the um the most beautiful and the best possible abiding forever simply in its own in the idea of itself so those are the two laws and these are the um this is the, the metaphysical basis, really, that he's going to build all of his study of states of mind. Music is building on this and really the whole dialogue and probably you can argue many dialogues building on this foundation. So it's important to be clear on this. There are many references back to it. These are the laws or the patterns. We're good. OK, so maybe you need to digest that a bit. I would encourage you to review that over the week and if you do have any questions next time please throw those in makes sense i mean mm -hmm. um i could see that written on a shirt i'm most excellent already so why change makes sense I think many people feel that way <laughs> many people do <laughs> there's a thing uh that uh, abiding the dude abides don't know what exactly that refers to but if if you were most excellent beautiful and good already hey uh -huh. just abide that's right yeah just be and for many people that is their idea of like a spiritual life is like uh we all have a buddha nature so you're already perfect you don't have to change just be I'm not saying that i agree with that <laughs> there's a way in which it's true but you know most of us aren't acting from that perfect Buddha nature. No, you need the t-shirt first. Mm, yeah, we still have to go through this and understand the veritable lies, for example, that we've been carrying around since childhood. Because most of us were not raised um, with the kind of censorship that he was talking about. All right, well, do we want to go on a bit or um, do we want to stop here? We're on a roll. Yeah.
Okay, we'll read a little bit more, and I think we'll come back and revisit what we're about to read, because I don't think we'll have time to do the full discussion about it, but there's a lot going on here. Okay, um, so we'll pick it up here. So no poet then should say these sorts of stories about God changing, and there'll be a few more examples here. So Jacob, when you're ready. Nor must anyone tell falsehoods about Proteus and Thetis, nor in any tragedy or in other poems bring in Hera disguised as a priestess collecting alms for the life-giving sons of Inachus, the Argive stream, and many similar falsehoods they must not tell. Nor again must mothers under the influence of such poets terrify their children with harmful tales, how that there are certain gods whose apparitions haunt the night in the likenesses of many strangers from all manner of lands, least while they speak evil of the gods, they at the same time make cowards of the children. They must not. But may we suppose that while the gods themselves are incapable of change, they cause us to fancy that they appear in many shapes deceiving and practicing magic upon us? Mm, perhaps. Consider, would a god wish to deceive or lie by presenting in either word or action what is only appearance? I don't know. Don't you know that the veritable lie, if the expression is permissible, is a thing that all gods and men abhor? What do you mean? This, that falsehood is the most vital part of themselves, and about their most vital concerns, is something that no one willingly accepts. But it is, oh, yeah, but it is there above all that everyone fears it. I don't understand yet either, but it is circled, so I feel it might be important. <laughs> that is because you suspect me of some grand meaning. But what I mean is this, that deception in the soul about realities to have been deceived and to be blindly ignorant and to have and hold the falsehood there is what all men would least of all accept. And it is in that case that they loathe it most of all. Quite so. But surely it would be most wholly right, as I was just now saying, to describe this as in very truth falsehood, Ignorance, namely in the soul of the man deceived, for the falsehood in words is a copy of the affection in the soul, an after-rising image of it, and not an altogether unmixed falsehood. Is not that so? By all means. Okay, so let's go back to the veritable lie. What does that seem to be so far? It's it, going to unwrap it more in the next section, but so far, what does it seem to be? Well, they were talking about how men would not want that deception in their soul the most. So would the veritable lie maybe be that lie that they themselves hold to be true? Mm. A deeply Good. held mm -hmm. lie? Mm. Okay, deeply held lie. Yeah, um, let's go to this last sentence of Socrates is here. It connects to this idea that you just said. For the falsehood in words is a copy of the affection in the soul an after-rising image of it, and not an altogether unmixed falsehood. So what is he saying there? And that connects to what you were saying.
that there's some <laughs> sense of truth in it, but they don't understand it. <laughs> Uh, what the actual truth is in it. How is he comparing the falsehood in the soul to the falsehood in words? Yeah, you want to jump in? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I feel like I'm gonna get off track. Um, there's a what the word copy um has a footnote to it. Um, so the falsehood in words is a copy of the soul. Oh yeah. Sorry, micro. Uh, copy. Doesn't look like anything. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't help too much. I think the footnote. <laughs> well, it it sounds like it's saying that the soul is the altogether unmixed, has the altogether unmixed falsehood mm -hmm. about um the most vital part of self and the most vital mm -hmm. concern. Mm -hmm. And the words would be a copy of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, look here. Yeah, let's take this sentence between pages 193 and 195. Falsehood in the most vital part of themselves. What is the most vital part of ourselves? The soul. What? Hmm. And about the most vital concerns is someone no, no one willingly accepts. What are our most vital concerns? Virtue? Hmm. Right, things such as virtue. Um, he doesn't fill it in, but we can imagine some things here, things like virtue or um, what we are. Um, in many dialogues, Plato says, you know, the, the most important thing is to know thyself. He says to know what is happiness, what it means to be a good person. He often ties virtue to happiness. And the right way to live is a common theme in his dialogue. So we can guess these are the sorts of things that he would say are of the most vital concern. So to hold a falsehood in the soul, in the most vital part of ourselves, we don't yet know if he's talking about the soul as one, as a simple one. Or if he's talking about it as having parts, he hasn't clarified at this point which way he's talking about it. But it may even be the most vital part of the soul, or the soul as a whole anyway. It's the most vital part of who we are, comparing the soul to the body. But in that most vital part of ourselves, to hold falsehoods about these things that are of a most important concern or vital concern, that's the thing that no one willingly accepts. That's what we most fear. And so that's what he's calling the veritable lie, the unmixed falsehood, as he words it in this final sentence here. Um, whereas the falsehood in words is simply a reflection of that. And so I think that also kind of goes back to what Jacob was saying earlier about potential versus actual. The, the lie in the soul is more actual than the lie in words, right? As it, it's like you might think of the lie in words as like a progression, if you will, from the soul moving outward into words. And so it's more in that realm of potential, whereas the lie in the soul is relatively more actual. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, if you... Like terminology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you think Sorry. you are a certain way and the world is a certain way, then mm -hmm. that would influence the sort of words you use and how you speak to people and what things you say. So you can mm -hmm. see how the words unfold mm -hmm. from our state of mind. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. They're a reflection of our state of mind. 
but to understand our state of mind, we have to look at the beliefs in the soul. And that's where he's going. And he's going to build on that more, a little bit more here. I think we just have one or two more sections in, in book two. Yeah, one more section in book two. And then in book three, he's going to go further into looking at what we build on those words in the soul, those beliefs in the soul, to look at our um, mannerisms and our attitudes, and our, as well as the words that we say our whole sense of character is built on this foundation. So here we're getting the foundation. And then in book three, we're going to build on that to see a more well-rounded picture of what a state of mind is. So that's where we're going. And we'll go into that next week. Can I ask, um, is there a special, uh, the veritable lie, the word veritable mm -hmm. in the Greek? Because I've heard the word, used or translated as uh in the truest sense a lie so the mm. word truth in mm. the is in the greek mm. maybe yeah yeah i don't know exactly what the greek word is but i've seen that as well so there are many ways you can say this the true lie wasn't that an arnold schwarzenegger movie true lies true lies um, yeah true but i have heard that used truly a lie or, mm. the true i've heard philosophers use it as uh, the true lie what is the true lie in in plato's republic Mm. Yeah, so you see, you didn't know that Arnold Schwarzenegger was a Platonist, huh? I, I, I did not know. You see, a Plato is working its way into Hollywood in, in the most surprising ways. Yeah, so yeah, there are many ways, I guess, you can probably translate this, but you can probably even just, you know, even just playing with the English, you can think of other ways to state it. But what is truly a lie? Uh, vital part of, of self. Mm -hmm. Is there a significance mm -hmm. in the Greek to the word vital? Um, in one sense, we, we are talking about the vital parts of the soul already. Uh, mm -hmm. the, in that the highest aspect of the soul, that which is most like the divine, mm -hmm. uh, that which is uh, most singular and least likely to change, um, uh, and the qualities to, to reach that, uh, courage and phronesis, these seem like the most vital um, parts of the soul and to be most like the divine would be the most vital concern. So we're already kind of talking about that, but I wonder if there's a, a special meaning of the word vital in Greek. Uh, not that I know offhand. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. But here, yeah, vital, I think, is in the sense of most important as opposed to most alive. Right, that makes sense. But yeah, but yeah, he doesn't clarify at this point what is the most vital part of ourselves. Also, the word "deceived" mm -hmm. um, in the soul of the man deceived. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That the true lie uh, comes from the deception. Mm. It's not something innate. Right. Absolutely not. Yeah. And there's also the mention of magic earlier, shapes and deceiving and practicing magic. When you're talking about the gods, um, that's going to come up again. So we're saying the gods don't do that. Right. They do not. This is a big thing um, from mm -hmm. the Christian background. Um, the idea that there is uh, innate badness or evil or mm -hmm. sin um, mm -hmm. and that there are scary gods that um, there is like the devil and, and, and bad spirits um, that can trick you with magic and, and japes and deceive you. Um, and this can create uh, a fear of the metaphysical, a fear of transcendence or a fear of spiritual things. Absolutely. Um, and even like a uh, historically a, a, a hatred and disdain for um spirituality especially mm -hmm. eastern spirituality mm -hmm. uh, even harry potter books mm -hmm. um because of this um i guess true lie about that which is most important that the gods deceive mm. um and use magic and mm -hmm. also um it is a way of um making sense of human problems without actually making sense of human problems Mm -hmm. If you have a God that does evil, 
mm-hmm. and uh, tricks people and, and, and you have uh, uh, an innate sinful nature, mm-hmm. you can very easily with this lie about mm-hmm. that which is most real, mm-hmm. you can very easily um, use that to make sense of the problems we face and instead of solving that problem with what we're reading here, correction through this learning and understanding and the correct education and the removal of this deceit, instead of that understanding approach to solving problems, it's just kill it, kill it with fire mm-hmm. and fear it or fear it um, because it is supernatural mm-hmm. desires, badness. Mm-hmm. Um, changes deceitful, uses magic, all of these things. So, so from that perspective, uh, historically and personally, um, I can see why it would be considered the most hated and the most feared. Because it not only does it play out tragically and and violently and terribly in history, but it makes one fear their own transcendence and spiritual experiences and 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 very aggressive towards others who are engaged in that which is most significant being most like the divine mm. themselves which is heresy in some traditions right yeah actually you know i just transitioned away from the text but i'm going to go back because what you just said also hits on what we see above here um, let me go a little further, right back where he talked about magic, and he talked about making about terrifying such poets terrify their children with harmful tales, and talking about making cowards of the children. That's at that section just above the veritable lie before it was introduced. So that very much is consistent with what you were just saying. And of course, when you buy into this idea, then you may have an excuse for why you are the way you are. If there are things about your life that aren't working well, you can maybe feel justified in your suffering that you can't help it. This is the life you were cho- that was chosen for you for whatever reason. Um, and you just go on being miserable. Um, but of course, the um, justified misery is still misery and being able to get out of it is much much healthier and and better which you can do if you realize that it's not misery for misery's sake Mm -hmm. you're not suffering because of the right christian puritanian view of the the way well goes back to the first law sorry to cut you off there but it goes back to the first law that if you are suffering there's something providential about it if you can learn from it Learning is key mm-hmm. and, and correction. And so the word chastisement mm-hmm. I, isn't the, w- the way it can be used, just putting somebody down for putting them down sake. Mm-hmm. It's again, it's the idea of learning. So mm-hmm. your own uh, misfortune, if understood in this way, which is most true, um, is merely a tool for learning, correcting turning yourself around and you talked about the eye of the soul in phronesis and how key that is. Well, it's the turning around to that uh, is commonly associated with awakening that Mm -hmm. eye of the soul. Mm -hmm. So it's learning at that point. And then at this point in uh, this third uh, law um, is key as well, because um, uh, uh, you're not solving problems by assigning a, a, uh, manif- ma- maleficent supernatural force to the divine. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, uh, you solve problems. Like it's not trying to use magic to trick you and, and should be feared and, mm-hmm. and so forth. It's, mm-hmm. uh, you should solve problems through again, learning, mm-hmm. learning. Exactly. Let's and, learn mm-hmm. together. Mm-hmm. Come on, come on guys. So we'll end it there today and then we will then we'll read this last section of book two next week and go on into book three seeing more about the building of states of mind or understanding states of mind okay so um anyone watching on youtube as always thank you for watching i would love for you to hit the the like button and subscribe if you don't already 
And if you do have any questions or comments, you can leave those in the comments section. And I hope you'll join us next week. Thank you very much. You have to get the wave in quick because Mindy finishes the video quickly. <laughs>